this. I just spilled oh. my tea. I'll have to go in there, Such a bad catch. Right. This is the brand new Asus Zenfone 10, and it's kind of a miracle. Right from the very moment I unboxed this phone, I just thought, yes. This makes sense. It comes with a hard case right at the very top, a USB-C to USB-C cable, and a 30 watt charger, all included. Plus, the color options. Every one of these phones looks beautiful, and I just love how this grippy, fingerprint-proof backplate gently curves into the matte black side rails. You know, it's funny because when the Zenfone 8 came out a couple of years ago, I actually thought it was hilarious how little character that phone had. But the company has very clearly heard this feedback and made it a mission to bless this phone with very clear personality. And then the most unique thing about it, the size. After years of accustoming myself to Pro Max size devices, the first thing I thought when this little cutie slid into my hand about three weeks ago is yes, this is how it should be. But I still won't switch to it. Most people will not switch to it. In fact, the moment that big phones in general started to take off in around 2011, 2012, phones like this that you can completely use in one hand have plummeted. I mean, just look at Apple. Apple tried not once, but twice to make a mini phone work. They introduced the idea with the 12 mini, used the 13 mini to fix that phone's mediocre battery, but even then it didn't sell. To the point where now with the iPhone 14s, they just decided, forget the smaller mini. We're going to instead release a plus, which is bigger than the normal iPhone. But isn't that kind of confusing? I mean, people clearly like the idea of something more manageable. The internet collectively lost their marbles when the iPhone 12 mini was first unveiled. Plus, that phone consistently scored between 4.5 and 5 stars in just about every single review when it came out. So the people who used it clearly enjoyed it. And like me right now, I'm not afraid to admit my phone is too big for me. It's heavy enough that it gets tiring after 20 minutes of holding it. And I'm constantly looking for surfaces to be able to prop my arm up against to support me with it. Not to mention that half the time I've now learned that I have to use the claw position. Partially because if I held it normally, there'd be no way I could actually use it with one hand, but also partially just to prevent it from tipping over and flattening my face. And like, I'm a tall guy, I'm six foot, I've got big hands for my height, why are we doing this to ourselves? Well, for starters, for the vast majority of people, a bigger screen is just better. Like yeah, this Zenfone 10 does have an exceptionally high-end panel. It's an AMOLED display supplied by Samsung. Colors look fresh and vibrant. It goes up to 144 hertz refresh rate and is covered in Gorilla Glass Victus for an added layer of drop protection. But if it was just a bit bigger, I could actually appreciate what's good about it so much more. Like comparing my Galaxy S23 Ultra versus this Zenfone, I'm getting a tangible amount more web page on screen at any one time. Not just vertically, but horizontally too. It means anything you watch is instantly more immersive. It sucks you in. Which is why if you ever visit phone stores, you'll find that people naturally gravitate towards playing with the store models that just have larger screens. Plus, it allows you to appreciate higher resolutions. The S23 tops out at 1440 by 3088, which makes watching videos on it, the equivalent of watching movies on a high-end TV. But there'd be no point putting a resolution like that on a phone of this size, because you just wouldn't be able to tell. The overall point being that when the screen quality is this high, and the phone itself is as powerful as this Zenfone 10 is, it just feels wasteful that the screen is not bigger too. And it also limits a customer's willingness to pay for it, even if at its core the phone is just as capable. But it gets even harder for mini phones like this, because not only are they less initially impressive to customers, but they also have to make do with far less internal space, which for starters means a smaller battery. And yeah, I mean, if you have a smaller display, that's naturally going to drain less battery, but that's not as big a saving as you might think. Like when Asus released the Zenfone 8 a couple of years ago, which had a 4,000 mAh battery, alongside it, they also released a bigger Zenfone 8 Flip, which had a 5,000 mAh battery. So about a 25% larger battery for a phone with a 25% larger screen. So you might think, okay, well, the end battery life will be about the same. But then you realize the screen is not the only component that's fighting for the phone's limited battery. Both phones also have to feed the same chip, the same main camera, the same networking equipment, the same software. And so in the end, you really feel the benefit of just having more juice, with the 5,000 mAh flip lasting a good 15% longer than the smaller Zenfone 8. And I mean, similarly here with the 10, while I am really impressed that they've managed to cram a 4,300 mAh battery into this body, alongside a wireless charging coil, it's still not gonna last as long as if they just made the phone a little bit bigger and made it a 5,300 mAh battery. And this matters more now than it ever has before, since the demand for battery intensive applications is going up. We are well past the stage 
stage where we're just using our phones to do one thing at a time on. We want to have our Uber Eats order preparing in the background. All of our social media is checking every single second for new incoming messages. The YouTube video minimized in the corner and a game in the foreground. Battery has become the most precious resource. Plus, because you have no room to split up the battery like you do on some larger phones, the charging is also on the slower side. You can expect a full battery in about 90 minutes of charging, and if you go wireless, 130. Then there's the thermal issue. Less space means that while you can have the same high-end chip that other big phones have, like this thing does, it has the very latest Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. You just have less airflow on the inside, which makes it harder to keep that chip cool. Credit where due, Asus has put a lot of copper on the inside to help conduct that heat out. And on a day-to-day -day basis, it does feel like a really snappy phone that when pushed to its peak, can pump out some staggering performance for something so delightfully pocket-sized. But because there's just less internal surface area to help with that heat conduction versus a bigger phone like the S23 Ultra, if you run the same task on both, this is going to get hotter, which is going to give it less ability to sustain that performance. You also have to compromise on cameras to make something compact, which is more significant than ever since cameras are quickly becoming the main change between new phones when they get released. And you might be thinking, looking at this, Aaron, don't be silly. These are massive cameras, to the point where these two cameras are bigger than every camera on the S23 Ultra put together. Um... um a bit misleading. Because actually, the Zenfone 10's main camera is about 20% smaller than Samsung's. It's just that these massive rings on the outside make it look like it's three times bigger. It's easy to do that on the outside. You can make this ring span the entire back of the phone if you wanted to. The point is not that this camera sensor is smaller than this camera sensor, because that's fine, there's also a price gap. You know, this is $1,200, this is $800. But it's that because the internal space is so valuable and so scarce in this compact phone, they would struggle to make it bigger even if they wanted to. Remember, cameras are not not just the camera bumps that protrude out. Like if we take off the back of this phone here, you can see that the camera occupies the entire depth of the phone, plus even more width than the exterior module suggests. And that's especially true if you want to be able to zoom in. Because to create zoom, you have to create distance between your camera sensor and your lenses. The more you want to zoom in, the more distance you've got to create. Obviously, there's only so much distance you can create if you just want to come out this way. So modern phones create distance horizontally, where often this zoom camera alone will span half the width of the phone. This is why you never get high magnification zoom cameras on small phones. You get one main camera and one ultra wide. And they're not bad here, but they're also not great. I mean, the main sensor is the same one found in mid ranges last year. And let's be very clear, while this isn't the most expensive phone you can get, it's definitely not a cheap phone either. And yet you can absolutely tell the difference in sensor size and quality when taking side by sides versus bigger phones, like the Pixel 7. Even though the Zen phone is actually more expensive than it. This is not Asus, like, nah, let's just cheap out this year and cash in big. It's the company trying really hard to balance all the things that they think users want with the added constraint of size on top of the already existing constraint of price. And what it all means is that if you really care what you're getting in your phone, like I do, then you'll tend to find yourself not necessarily going for the phone size that's most comfortable, because yeah, I mean, smaller is better for that, but instead going for the larger size that you know that you can just about tolerate, which is why people tend to end up with phones that are larger than their hands would ideally appreciate. Now I will say, it is quite cool how Asus is pushing the limits of what a small phone can do. Like this button on the side, the power button, is also a fingerprint scanner. But not just that, it's a shortcut button. And not just for one shortcut, you can program a long press, a double press, and even a slide to control things. There's very much the mentality here of how do we maximize the components that we do have. They managed to squeeze in a headphone jack and full IP68 water and dust resistance. You actually completely missed the phone. <laughs> I think you managed to wear everything but the phone. <laughs> Take my word for it. To try and counteract the lack of a zoom camera, when you zoom in here, the phone automatically switches to an algorithm that takes a full-size RAW photo as the base image to apply processing on, so it preserves the detail that it does get. To try and compensate for the less physical space for the lens to be able to counteract your hand movements, this phone uses some really nifty software that uses your phone's gyro sensors to figure out how much stabilization your phone needs in any given moment, and then crops more or less into your frame to be able to give it the room to add that stability if needed. They've even created software that listens out for when bass is present in the music you're listening to and just basically chucks a load more on top to again, try and correct for the fact that this is a small phone with less ability to push air and therefore create boomy sound. These are all really clever, really innovative things that genuinely make a difference, but 
The hardest pill to swallow is that even with all of it, it's still not cheaper to make a smaller phone. I mean, if you look at the absolute cheapest smartphones that money can buy right now, if you purged Wish.com of everything they had, they are all bigger than this. See, because of the shift in preference for bigger screens over time and more extreme hardware, if 10 years ago, let's say the assumed size of a smartphone was this, well now, it's this. And if this has now become the standard template, this is the format for which parts are the most widely available, being manufactured on the largest scale, and therefore, the cheapest. And so if you wanna make something smaller than that, you don't necessarily pay less for things just because, well, you're getting less. You can end up paying just as much, if not more, because what you're asking for is effectively a custom job. And that doesn't just apply to screens. I mean, as another example, just to be able to fit all these high-end components into this small shell, Asus has had to design a custom PCB. And when you look at a spec sheet or you compare this to bigger phones, you don't see that. All you might see is the things they've had to shave off, not the engineering feat required to actually make this possible. And this is why compact phones are almost confined to being a niche now. Most companies have stopped investing in them, but if you are looking for one, you can't really do much better than this. All right, let's film this on the Zenfone. I actually have some pretty big tech news. So you might've heard me talking about the Opera browser over the last few months. Well, it's just been upgraded to Opera One. It's a completely redesigned modular browser that fits around the way that you use the internet. So for example, it automatically groups tabs together to create collapsing tab islands. So if you're like me and you open a thousand things at any one time, but also don't like clutter, then this makes chaos somehow feel organized. The modular design aspect means that it can dynamically adjust itself if you say add an item to the sidebar or extensions. And it does so with some rather sleek looking animations, thanks to the multi-threaded compositor technology that Opera is the first major browser to implement. But the coolest thing is, you might remember a while ago, Opera started working with OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT. Well, based on that, Opera has now launched their own native browser AI called Aria. It essentially combines the GPT chat knowledge with live search access, so that you can get up-to-date results for free without relying on 2021 knowledge. So head the link in the description to download Opera now.